Welcome to My Horse University and eExtensions live webcast. This is going to go over the top 10 tips for coaching youth riders. Our speaker tonight is Karen Waite. Karen is an equine extension specialist at, in Michigan and teaches and advises equine students in the Department of Animal Science at Michigan State University. Her extension roles, she coordinates the Adult Equine Extension Program, the Michigan Equine Survey, and is the Director of Leadership Development for My Horse University. She also oversees Youth Equine Extension Program and is active with eExtension Horse Quest as well. Karen is a board member of the American Youth Horse Council and is a card judge with the ABRA. She has a bachelor's degree in education and animal science and a master's degree in animal science with a nutrition emphasis. She's presently working on her doctoral degree in sports psychology. Please welcome Karen and a couple of tips. Please um, type in the text chat to ask questions during the presentation. And we will also save room and we will also at the end of the presentation at the end for of questions the and answers as well. For questions and answers as well. Thank you, Kate. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, I'd just like to get started with our first of the top 10 tips for coaching youth riders. And there are so many things that we do with horses, so many different disciplines and activities, that it would be very, very difficult to come up with 10 very technical, detailed tips. But what we can do is talk about some general things that can help improve any uh, equine program related with youth or lesson program. So as I said, our first tip is respect the horse first. Um, sometimes young riders take a while to understand that horses aren't necessarily motorcycles. And even if a young person would like to go to a horse show and ride in every possible class available, um, it's important that they understand that a horse needs to be fit enough to do the job that we ask of it, um, and that not every horse has the talent to excel in every single event. Um, I'm quite tall, personally, but I'm not a great basketball player, and there are lots of horses out there who are not particularly designed for some of the things we ask them to do. So uh, it's important to teach your riders right from the start that horses deserve to be in the best shape they can be to do the job we ask them to, and they deserve to be involved in events and activities they're suited for. Um, if you are fortunate enough to have um, enough, or excuse me, if you're fortunate enough to have the opportunity to choose the right horse for your rider, uh, that, that's a, a good situation to be in because you can get a feel for the young rider's goals and also for um, the horse's talents and match them that way. But horses are definitely unique individuals. Um, they have their own personalities or horsepersonalities, I guess as Pat Pirelli calls them. Um, so they have personalities just like people do. And as an example, a high-strung horse is probably not a great match for a high-strung novice rider. So as a coach, that's something that you can help the young rider um, if you have the opportunity to uh, help them select their horse that you can help them deal with. In addition, it's important to make sure that all tack and equipment fit the horse appropriately and that those items are well adjusted and suitable for the horse. Um, uncomfortable horses do not uh, make for enjoyable activities for young people and that's really what we want to provide. I see Danielle's asked a question. Um, how do you explain to a young child that they should not be entering every class in one day if they become very upset? Um, my experience with kids has been that they really love their equine partners and if they understand that it may not be, that the, their horse may not be ready or, or needs a bit more um, conditioning before they're ready to do every single class, they, they typically understand that. They don't want to hurt their equine partner and um, oftentimes they, their understanding of that fact. Um, if, you, if they do get upset, um, we'll talk a little bit later about dealing with disappointment as one of the top 10 tips and we can really use that disappointment 
It was a teachable moment. Okay, our number nine tip, moving on, is that we need to recognize that young people do not necessarily whoops, reap all of the positive benefits of equine experience just by doing it, um, like the Nike commercial. Uh, we all know that participation in equestrian activities has the potential to develop character. However, good character actually needs to be taught. It can't be caught. Uh, research shows that coaches can teach both riding and positive life skills by modeling these behaviors. And I'm not really sure, Kate, if maybe you could help us. I'm not sure why we're flipping through all of our tips. But in any case, um, research shows that coaches can teach both riding and positive life skills if they model those behaviors themselves. So as an example, um, if a coach or instructor demonstrates and consistently demonstrates quiet, soft hands when, when, when they ride and they reward horses and young people when they do the right thing or make the right choice, that's an example of modeling that kind of good character. And as uh, coaches or instructors of youth riders, that's one thing that we really play an important role in. Um, they look to us for guidance. Um, we provide, we act as role models for them oftentimes. And so what they see us doing is what they tend to do themselves. And there's just no getting around that. So when we work with young people, um, we need to always be conscious of how we behave and how we treat our horses. But there are just so many ways that we can teach um, good character through horses. That, um, that we just wouldn't even have the time probably to address them all here. Okay, our number eight tip is to teach young people to be internally rather than externally motivated. And that sounds um, kind of complicated, but it really isn't. Um, youth coaches can develop and model um, motivation from the inside out rather than motivation by the desire for a prize. And of course, young people enjoy competition, and I enjoy competition personally, but um, the, the most effective and long-term benefit, or one of the most effective and long-term benefits that we can get from participating in equine activity is to develop internal motivation for participating rather than doing it just for a ribbon. Um, we can create this opportunity through helping young people focus on goal setting and periodically reviewing those goals with young people. For, so as an example, if we have a, a rider who decides to perfect their horse's right foot hind quarter pivot and showmanship, and they do so, then we need to review that goal later and replace it with a new one. So periodic review of goal setting um, is, is one example of how we can teach young people to be internally motivated. Um, and then celebrating the attainment of those goals. Rather than putting our focus on celebrating a blue ribbon, which obviously we would do, uh, we can also have daily celebrations for the attainment of goals, small goals, uh, small skill attainments, or just taking baby steps. Um, so making a big deal out of those things, as well as a big deal out of performance in the show ring can help young people develop that internal motivation to excel. And not all of you, um, may miss, I mean, it's a little difficult to tell, but um, some of you may not have young people who have a desire to show horses. Um, you may have riders in your, your club or your group who focus on trail riding, for example. Um, this can be done with those riders, too. There are lots of skills that we need to achieve to be successful and safe on the trail. And when those skills are attained, uh, we can have a celebration of, of that skill atta attainment, just as we might be able to in the show ring. OK. Our number, number seven tip uh, is to encourage young riders to seek out and be energized by challenges. Um, occasionally, uh, with young people and, and with older riders too, 
uh, we find a level or skill or a level or a skill that they're able to succeed in and they really don't want to move on. Um, it, we get comfortable and we get rewarded for uh, participating at a certain level and we don't want to go on to something else necessarily. Um, when a walk trot rider has great success in walk trot, sometimes they don't necessarily want to move on to walk trot canter. Uh, but we need to encourage them to try new things, new classes, new skills in their riding. Um, this could also be in the form of trying, say, a large open show circuit or a breed circuit show or a new or more challenging trail uh, that they, they hadn't tried before. So one of the things that we can really do to help our young riders um, is to encourage them to seek new challenges whenever possible. Does anybody have any questions or anything to this point? I uh, think I can try to watch the text box and talk at the same time, hopefully. So I would certainly encourage those if anybody has any questions or discussion. Okay, number six. We need to help our young riders see their development as a controllable process rather than a fixed quality. And sometimes our young riders think that their abilities are limited. Um, and one thing that we can do as riding instructors that even will carry over into their daily life is to teach them, in fact, they are unlimited in their potential to achieve. Um, for some it may take longer, but they can all improve uh, with patient, consistent guidance. Um, riders with or without disabilities have gone on to achieve success at a very high level, both on a horse and off a horse. And if they understand that their abilities aren't fixed but can always be developed further, can always advance, um, and they appreciate that fact, they can go on to some really, really great things. Well, this is the tip I was referring to when we uh, mentioned disappointment earlier when, when Danielle asked that question. Um, so number five is to help our young riders learn to accept success and failure as part of the game. Um, for whatever reason, we sometimes have a tendency to gloss over the idea that uh, we may have disappointments with horses. And I'm sure all of you have been working with horses for quite some time and have noticed that disappointments are absolutely part of the game. Um, but sometimes when they do occur, and they, again, always do, uh, we may work very hard to either eliminate the disappointment, protect our young people from the disappointment, and truthfully, um, I think that that's kind of unfortunate. I mean, granted, we don't want to be, I mean, we're not happy when they're unhappy, but sometimes failure and disappointment can be um, the best teachers in any aspect of life, but including writing. And we can help young people embrace that teachable moment when, when those disappointments come. Um, it's certainly not the most enjoyable aspect of working with horses, but it is valuable, and as adults, we can help them see where the positives might be or how um, things may improve as a result of this disappointment. And honestly, it's, it's pretty rare for anybody to achieve very, very high levels of success without having to deal with some failure and disappointment on the way. So um, I know when I was a young and uh, would occasionally come off my horse. Um, I had a 4-H leader who always told me that all the good riders have come off their horse. And while it was not my most enjoyable experience, um, it certainly helped me to see that if I really, really wanted to get good, um, that, that perhaps I would have to deal with some disappointments and some, some falling off. As long as I got back on, it was okay. Okay, our number four tip is to model all of the tips we've mentioned so far by continuing your own education. And I would have to say this is kind of preaching to the choir uh, since you are all clearly committed to furthering your equine education or you wouldn't be participating in the webcast. Um, I, I definitely commend you for doing that. Um, the horse industry can only 
benefit and be improved by those who are willing to continue their own education and development and uh, clearly all of you are but ways that you can continue to do that uh, beyond this webcast are to attend clinics um, potentially be certified as instructors if you haven't already done so there are several good um, instructor certification associations CHA is one, the American Writers, Writing Instructor Association is one, and there are quite a few more that um, certainly lend uh, credibility and help you improve your skills as a writing instructor beyond um, just our little short time together tonight. Uh, My Horse University, which you're clearly all familiar with, offers a variety of courses that can help you develop your equine skills and extension.org forward slash horse is the e-extension horse quest site which is a national site where you can find uh, all kinds of excellent articles learning lessons tips and in the near future we'll have a leaders curriculum where you'll be able to um, complete some learning lessons receive a certificate and move through a series of levels designed specifically for leaders. So we're really looking forward to that. Um, if you're from Michigan, we have an adult riding clinic that we offer in June called Simplifying Successful Horsemanship. That's a hands-on, bring your horse type of clinic held at the MSU Pavilion. Um, and that sort of activity also is a way to continue your own education and by doing so, you'll model uh, those kinds of behaviors we've mentioned so far that'll benefit young people in the long run. Um, if they see you getting excited about learning more and continuing your own education, um, that kind of thing is infectious and they'll certainly follow along. Okay, our number three tip, and this one is probably one of the life-changing things I've learned as I've progressed through my education and through my life and that is to recognize that everyone uh, learns differently both human and horse so hopefully you've had the opportunity to review the My Horse University eTips article on learning styles and that was sent out not too long ago and I believe it's still available on the My Horse University site um, this issue or, or concept, I should say, of learning styles was one of the most important things I ever learned in college. Um, I happened to be a student who struggled with organic chemistry. I don't know if anybody on this webcast has ever had to take organic chemistry, but it was not very enjoyable either time that I took it. And I kept thinking, this must be me. I must just not be an intelligent person. And when I took an education course where we learned about learning styles, I finally realized that it wasn't necessarily me. Um, my learning style was simply not conducive to the way that organic chemistry was taught. Um, I tend to focus, uh, I teach a course here at MSU for people who are interested in becoming riding instructors, and we always spend one lecture on learning styles. Um, for those of you with an education background, you know that there are a variety of different learning styles, um, as many as nine or 11, I think, at this point. But the ones I tend to focus on are audio, visual, and kinesthetic. Um, and audio is clearly people who learn well by listening or by talking, who, by using sound as a way to take in information and share information. Uh, visual is those who prefer to take in information through reading, through demonstrations, uh, through visual, being able to, to visualize things. Um, and then kinesthetic is the learning style where people need to actually do things. So they actually are involved with hands-on activities. And I have a tendency to think that naturally gifted writers are probably very kinesthetic learners. But in any case, um, when you have an idea of this concept of learning styles, um, it helps tremendously um, 
And the other thing that's interesting is that we have a tendency to teach to our predominant learning style. So if you are a kinesthetic instructor, you're probably the sort of instructor who has, who tends to put a rider's leg in a particular position or actually move and emphasize feel, which can be really difficult to explain, frankly, to somebody who doesn't have a kinesthetic learning style. Um, and, and feel can be difficult to explain to anyone, I guess. But um, if you are struggling to get through to a student, what I would suggest you do is maybe think a little bit about the way you're teaching and the methods by which maybe your students might learn better. Um, perhaps it's not the same way as you teach. So if you're a kinesthetic instructor with a visual, more visual rider, you may be further ahead to have someone demonstrate the proper position or you know, the, the correct way to um, approach a fence as opposed to trying to ex describe the feel or uh, move the, the rider's leg into a particular position. Um, and truthfully, there really isn't scientific evidence necessarily to support the notion that horses have different learning styles, but I tend to think that, and, and you probably do as well, um, I tend to think that they do. Um, horses, not every horse fits into every person's training program. There are trainers out there who have very specific programs that they would like horses to follow, and if the horse doesn't follow that particular program, uh, they don't find success in that particular training barn. Um, I guess if I were an owner of a horse like that, and I happen to be an owner of a horse like that, to be honest, um, it's, it's time when, when the horse doesn't fit into a particular program and the trainer isn't willing to change, um, it may be that a different trainer would have more success with the horse. Um, and, and so that's just something to consider. Uh, maybe best for all involved to try a program more suited to either that horse or to that rider. Uh, the same is true for riders. If a, a trainer teaches in a certain way and the rider um, doesn't learn well that way, then it may be worth considering another option. Okay, we're working our way down. So our number two tip is to deliver positive, specific, contingent feedback to youth and horses. And positive, specific, contingent feedback probably sounds familiar to many of you. Um, those words are pretty much the building blocks of basic horse training, and honestly, they're the building blocks of child development or helping children learn in a lot of ways, I think, as well. Um, so by positive, I think we're all clear on what we're meaning by positive. Um, we want to make sure that riding is fun. As instructors or 4-H leaders, we would hopefully like to keep young people involved in our programs and involved in horses for the long term because we know how much they've done for us. And the way to do that is to keep it positive. Um, we need specific feedback. So if you can avoid making general comments like good job or nice, um, those two things really, while they're positive, um, they don't really tell a rider much about their performance. So if you can tie your, your comments to specific skills and only make those comments when those specific skills are achieved, uh, you'll really speed up the learning process. So as an example, rather than saying, good job, um, focus instead on saying things like, I like the way that you're looking for that next barrel, or your leg was in a great position going over that last fence. Uh, this will both speed up the rider's skill development as well as their internal motivation to succeed. Um, they'll know specifically what it was you liked, specifically what it did, what it was that they did well, and um, that kind of clarity really encourages the learning process. And one thing you may want to consider doing as an instructor is taping yourself during a lesson. Um, you probably have to be brave to actually do that, and, and you do have to be brave to do it, but uh, if you tape yourself 
videotape yourself during a writing lesson. Or you could, you could audio tape it too, but if you videotape it, you'll be able to see what your comments were in reference to with the writer. But go back and just listen to yourself and watch yourself and see if your comments are primarily positive or if maybe they're negative or focused specifically on technical details but not necessarily very encouraging or maybe they're very encouraging and that's good too. Um, but if you videotape yourself a couple of times a year um, that'll really help you improve not just your writer's ability but your own teaching ability and coaching ability as well. Um, sometimes we don't realize what it is we're saying. Uh, we think we're being positive or we think we're being specific and contingent but then when we go back and review the tape we find out that maybe that wasn't quite the case. So I would just encourage you to try that on occasion to see um, where your uh, coaching skills lie. And then of course we're all the way down to our number one tip for coaching youth riders and that is to make it fun. Um, typically young people are involved with horses because it's a fun activity that they enjoy. So if at all possible it's important to keep the focus on those things. Um, yes, they will potentially climb the ladder of success um, and they may find that their families are putting more money and time and emotion into equestrian sport. Um, but even then it's, it's important to emphasize fun. Uh, we don't want to lose fun even in the hoopla that goes with spending a lot of money if, if that's what families choose to do or spending even more time and even more emotion on our equestrian friends or our equine friends, excuse me. Um, so even in those situations, if we can emphasize fun and make it fun, um, we will definitely provide our young people with a great experience and hopefully one that they'll take with them like I did for a lifetime. Um, I owe my continued uh, involvement in the horse industry to some excellent coaches and excellent 4-H leaders that did all of the top 10 tips. So with that I think I'll open it up to questions. This will be a little shorter webcast than we sometimes have but when there's 10 tips um, <laughs> you can only talk about 10 tips. Okay, Jamie has a question. How do you feel about youth focusing on one event too early in their career? For example, a youth writer only doing dressage, or should we encourage them to diversify? Um, that is an excellent question. Uh, truthfully, and this is going to sound a little, I don't want it to sound counter to what I said earlier, um, but I think it is a good thing to encourage riders to do or to try some other things as well. Um, it potentially can only improve their riding and you know if they try say cross country and they decide this is really not for me, I want to continue to focus on dressage, um, then they can go back to that. But uh, at least in the early going I think we spend a little too much time in all sports, not just in equine sports, but in all sports um, having our young people start to specialize in a particular sport too early um, and I, I think we kind of cheat them out of having the opportunity to find out, you know, they may love dressage but they may find that they love reining, which is a lot, certain aspects of it are a lot like dressage um, they may love that even more or equally and and so I I would rather we not um, have kids specialize early on. Okay, Danielle has a question too. Um, in regards to respecting the horse, how should a separate observer act when another young rider is showing their horse in say 18 classes in one day? This has happened to me, but I was not the coach of the girl and did not think it was my business to say anything. As a note, the trainer that she bought the horse from did not say anything. Um, we do actually see that, and I see it more frequently. I shouldn't say I see it, but I know it happens um, more than I would like for it to. Um, 
And I think the important thing to do is keep an eye on the horse. Um, if it's not in the condition to handle, let's say it has a body condition score of four or it's, its ribs are showing um, and that it's, it's clearly not able to, um, to handle 18 classes in one day, which I'm not sure very many horses really are physically able to handle 18 one classes in one day and do it very well. Um, I think that it would be worth at least saying something to the coach of the young rider or to the if the parents if there was no coach present. Um, simply that, you know, and, and if there was a way that you could diplomatically point out that perhaps it would be better if the horse didn't go in 18 classes. Um, Sometimes our judges will mention that as well, um, and it's important. In uh, Danielle, I'm not sure. Are you from Michigan, or okay? Well, sometimes in Michigan, as you know, it can be very hot and very humid, <laughs> and uh, um, we uh, need to keep an eye on our equine partners to make sure that they're not getting dehydrated. Um, with 18 classes, one of the tests for dehydration is to tent the skin and then let it go and it should snap right back. If it doesn't snap right back, um, that would indicate that the horse is getting dehydrated. And if, if you were able to do that and show um, the, the coach or the parents specifically that maybe this wasn't good for the horse, um, that might be one way to, to address it. And I think even if we just address it, whether they, as long as we're diplomatic and, and kind about it, um, even if they don't want to hear what you have to say, it'll probably make them stop and think about what they're doing. Sure. Do we have any other questions or comments? Jamie's question, do you have two key tips for coaching tough parents of young riders, and I'm assuming she means that aren't 100% on board with these 10 steps, is that right? Right now it looks like it just it says that 100% on board, but I'm going to assume that you mean that are not 100% on board with these 10 steps. Um, if it were me, and I have... Um, Okay, there you go. Students are on board, parents are not. Okay. Um, honestly, this one can be very tough. Um, I would probably see if I could convince the parents to maybe, while they could come and watch, um, if there was a way that they could maybe stay away from the rider for 15 minutes before the class and 15 minutes after so that you could do your job and they could support their young rider. Um, that would be one thing I would try to encourage them with. I have witnessed parents who, how can we say this, parents who <laughs> really um, did not model appropriate behavior, um, who maybe used language that um, we would rather not hear at a horse show. And I think at some point, while I mean, in these tough economic times, you don't want to give up any customers, um, I think there may come a time when if the parent's philosophy is not in keeping with your philosophy, um, that it, it may be time to suggest that they find a different trainer. Um, but there are certainly ways to try to say to the parent, um, you know, I'm, you've hired me to do a job and I'm happy to do the job, but in order for me to do it, I need you to stay away from this rider for 15 minutes before and after their test or, or what have you. Um, that would be one. The second one would be um, to know when it wasn't an appropriate relationship. Okay, we've got two more questions. I'll go to Julia's and then I'll come back to Jamie's. Um, if a rider only rides once a month at 4-H, how can they improve their skills? Um, I would say 
that you still can improve your skills, Julia, or the people that you're referring to still can improve their skills, Julia, um, but it's just going to take a lot longer um, if you only have a once a month opportunity to ride. One thing you may want to look into is there are several books for developing your strength in uh, equine events. And I think there's one called The Total Rider, and I'm sorry I can't remember the, um, the author right now. But you may want to look at those books and do those exercises in between uh, when you ride uh, in that month in between. So that will develop some of your physical strength. Um, the other thing you potentially can do is watch videos. Um, one thing that's interesting about our brains is that um, they don't always know, or our brains don't always know, whether if we're physically doing a skill or whether we're um, not. So visualizing yourself riding um, can help. Improving your muscle tone through the exercises we talked about can help. Watching videos can help. Um, Sometimes when I, when I was little, I used to, or when I was younger, I would take a, a bridle and hook it over a chair and practice um, taking my reins up or getting them longer or um, switching from two hands to one hand. Um, all of those things are things that you can do in between to uh, try to improve your skills. And then Jamie had a second question. Do you think there's a time when young riders have a different learning style than their parents and that affects the goals and or interpretations of the lessons and the successes? Uh, I would say absolutely. Um, there's clearly, uh, and it's not unusual for young riders to have different learning styles from their parents and that definitely can affect um, maybe not so much the goals but definitely the interpretation of um, how lessons went. Um, and I think, you know, I'm not sure all parents are aware of the differences in learning styles and, and it might be helpful to, to point out that, um, you know, you may have a different learning style than, the, than your young person or you may have a different learning style than me um, as the instructor. But I'm working to figure out what your young rider's learning style is and I'll, I'll do all I can to address um, these skills in keeping with their learning style and just promise them that they'll see improvement because I think they definitely will. Okay. Danielle asks, if you see a rider that has a lot of potential but is with a trainer that does not showcase that skill, do you think it would be okay to approach the rider and make a sales pitch to give them lessons? Um, I would say ethically Probably not at the horse show, no. Um, I think that if you have the opportunity to interact with a rider or the rider's family, um, you may want to approach them in a different area or arena and say, you know, I think that you have a lot of potential in this area and if you're ever interested in making a change, I'd be happy to help you. I think that probably would be the best way to handle it um, that would keep things positive because in the industry or in your area um, just because you know you wouldn't necessarily want somebody making a sales pitch to one of your customers but it, you, you could at least suggest that if they're ever interested in making a change you'd be willing to help them and that would probably increase the young writer's confidence a ton even if they never did make the change. And you're welcome, Julia. I encourage you to keep working on it. Thanks. Okay, do we have any other questions? Okay, what's the best way to encourage confidence in a young rider? Um, I think that there are multiple ways. Again, it depends a lot on um, the rider, but just like any um, training situation, if you can take them to a level that you know they'll succeed and have them 
perform that skill, um, praise, 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 and, and tell them how proud you are of them at that level, and then go to possibly the next level. And then when they achieve that, um, definitely praise. Um, and occasionally, you may find yourself where um, you know a rider can do something, but they're not necessarily sold on the idea either. Uh, but you know that their balance is good enough that, let's say, they'll be able to, and this is a pretty basic one, but they'll be able to canter successfully. Um, and they're, they're nervous about it. Um, you may ask them to, to share with them, share with you, um, that they're nervous and you know take that very seriously don't just say oh no you can do it don't even worry about it take take their concerns seriously and then say well I, I appreciate that but I really I know you can do it so let's give it a try and um, once they do succeed those little that's the thing about riding horses those little achievements like cantering for the first time um, make a huge difference in a rider's confidence or Possibly saying, look, you know, you can you can do something that somebody they admire, maybe who doesn't ride, can't do, um, or you know, your your mother hasn't been on a horse in 15 years, but look at you trotting around posting. Um, all of those little things that we can do to encourage confidence in riders um, are important. Sure. Okay, Michelle says that she has a young rider that needs a little confidence. When she has a young rider that needs a little confidence, she takes them off the horse and works with them on the ground around horses, like helping to feed. Um, I found that their lack of confidence actually has to do with trusting their knowledge of horses and how they act. Is this a good pr approach? I would say yes, it's definitely a great approach. Um, another thing that can be helpful, um, depending on your philosophy, is either lunging horses or um, and help be right there with them to do this uh, or lunging them in a round pen so free lunging or even just going out into a pasture of horses and teaching kids how to move them with body language um, you have to be very careful and you have to be right there with them to make sure that they don't get too close or in a dangerous situation but I find that lunging helps improve um, confidence tremendously too because they need to know what position to stand in. They aren't necessarily, um, they don't have to worry about falling off and they learn to start and stop horses and move them around. So I would definitely say yes that um, taking riders off and having them do some things on the ground uh, helps a lot. I'm not sure that I, um, I think I may have missed a, a question but let me see if I can go back up. Okay. Um, Jamie says, my two cents and for discussion, it's been her experience that riders that cannot ride very regularly do well with a specific homework program. It's important to establish the goals up front, but then use your limited time with them on the horse to develop some homework for next time. Fitness, unmounted exercises, a specific video, lots of specific suggestions or projects, much like the homework you got for piano lessons. It makes you work, think hard about your system too instead of just teaching what is in front of you. It makes you focus on lesson plans. Um, my thought, thoughts would be that all of that is a great idea or are great ideas. Um, the best instructors that I've worked with and I still um, take lessons now and probably always will um, but my instructors give me homework too and that homework can include um, all of the things that you've talked about here. So. I don't think that ever ends, and that's part of what makes um, riding so enjoyable. Uh, and I always think it's important for instructors to focus on their own lesson plans. Um, some of some instructors don't necessarily have lesson plans, but I think it is important to to focus on at least coming up with some objectives for a particular lesson that you want to cover. And then if you're unable to help your rider achieve those particular objectives, having some homework for next time, and then going back to it the next time can be really beneficial. So you may have to take a few notes or, or keep a journal or a diary of your classes 
so that you can remember what happened, what you worked on, and what you need to do for next time.